I'm Dick Doucette, Major, United States Air Force, one of the F-105 fighter pilots that took part on this particular raid. As I think back on this particular day, I remember waking up with a great feeling of anxiety. The night before we had been pre-briefed on this particular target, we knew where we were going. We knew it was going to be a demanding mission probably more demanding than any mission we've flown to date. On the appearance of General Myers, we sensed an even greater feeling for the importance of this target. As I sat there intently listening to the numerous details of the briefing, I wondered if the other pilots in the room shared my feelings. Feelings on various aspects of this mission the weather, the timing, the target defenses, flak, MIGs, SAMs, tactics. I see Lieutenant Colonel Hopkins, mission commander, George Ball, Brock Campbell, Colonel Parsons, Colonel Sams, Ed Scourin, Ron Johnson, and all the others. What were their feelings? Then Major Russell finalized the briefing. General Myers, in conclusion, again restated, you're all pros. You've been selected for this particular job. Your job is to get the bombs on the target, destroy that POL dump. With your backgrounds, I have no doubt about the results. As we left the main briefing room, there was no doubt about the objective. It was clear in our minds. Then returning to the squadron, there was even more briefing. This time it was narrowed down to smaller elements. The individual tactics, the teamwork, the infighting, the mutual coverage. A final recheck of the target, the turn points, the timing. And in conclusion, be alert and be careful, gentlemen. As we left operations, minute details were covered again and re-emphasized. The pre-flight was more meticulous this morning, more detailed. As many of us climbed the ladder, things became more familiar. Many of us having up to and more than a thousand hours in this aircraft. As Colonel Hopkins said, when I sat there and looked at those gauges and they stared back reassuringly at me, all attention was relieved and I felt right at home again. Vespas, let's start. Let's taxi. I was Vespa 4. The machine was now rolling. As I taxied down the ramp, I could see other pilots in their aircraft, just waiting to slip into their assigned positions. There's Ron Johnson, Moose Curran, Turk Turley. We hear familiar calls. Vespa 4, call when clear. Roger, Vespa 4 is clear. Roger, this is Cutter Taxian. Yes, everything's going fine now. A final look over the air patch. A crew chief keeping his eye on that aircraft, watching for any small malfunction. A thumbs up signal. Everything's okay up to here. A final wave to a buddy. The whole force was now taxiing. RF-101s from other bases. Tankers, MIGCAP, other 105s from our sister base. All starting on a pre-brief signal. All to meet at a certain point in space. 
and then we were to converge on the target. The tower cleared us for takeoff. The 105 responded normally. Power was up. And after all this preparation, we were on our way at last. While the rest of the force was taxiing and taking off, Vespa was on his way. On his way to the tanker to pick up his gas and then press on to the target. En route to the target, we didn't have time to think about much, except to recheck our navigation, ensure that we were on course, recheck our turn points, fuel, time. Was there any flak? When were we going to see our first flak? Scan the area. Watch out for the megs. Any SAMs. Everything was going fine. We were assured we were getting close to the target. And then the flak started coming. The adrenaline was flowing. There was the final checkpoint. There was more flak. Colonel Hopkins led the first flight in. Then Ron Johnson led his four in. Then a follow-up by three other flights. As we looked back, we could see that the fire had started. Flights behind us would have something to shoot for, to do the job more completely, to completely obliterate it. As we pulled off the target, we heard the anxious calls of the flight leads. Let's get together here. Best believe this is two. I'm losing my hydraulic pressure. I don't know if my controls will hold out till I get back. As I pulled off, I felt a thump. I thought I had been hit. Fumes started in the cockpit and were so strong that my eyes started burning. The tears were rolling down my cheek. I called number three. I said, best for three. I think four's been hit here. Would you check me over? After he checked me over, he reassured me that my aircraft was okay. There was no fuel or hydraulic fluid dripping out. As I later learned, it was nothing but a malfunction in the refueling system, where some of the aircraft gas had been seeping into the cockpit. Then the fumes started to disappear. Everything was okay. We looked back again at that column of smoke, just rising, getting larger. We could see secondary explosions from the flights behind us making it even a greater fire. We knew that the job had been well done, that that P.O. all dump had been well hit. However, there was still more to do after we left the target area. The observations around the target area, what, would, what could we report to intelligence? What could we see? Coasting out from the target was probably harder than going in. But with the feeling of satisfaction, we had to remind ourselves again that we had to get these airplanes home and ourselves along with them. The flak was starting to be more intense now, even more intense than when we were rolling in on the target. dodging, turning, just trying to get to the point where we could be free of this black. And then, once we passed the river, we knew we were fairly safe, but we still had to get home. 
Our fuel was running down. It was time to call the tankers. We had to effect a rendezvous. We had to take on that needed fuel to get to our home base. As we located the tankers and joined on them, I found that I could not take any gas on. All the gas they were trying to put in my aircraft was just slipping over the side and streaming out. Something had to be done immediately. A quick decision? No, not really. This was a result of our briefings. We had a plan should we not be able to take gas on. That was to land at our alternate. So immediately I set course for the alternate base. I eased my aircraft down into the traffic pattern. The touchdown felt good. And then the familiar feeling of the drag chute blossoming behind me, slowing the aircraft down. I was now on the rollout. My flying portion of the mission was finished. My thoughts then wandered back to the others. Were they all getting back safely? How about George Ball, Vespa II? With his hydraulic problems, did his controls hold out? Was he able to make it back? As I turned off the runway, all of a sudden, I, it occurred to me, I was tired. This was a long mission. Then one after another, they started rolling in. Their bellies and wings stripped of the bombs and fuel tanks. I'm sure each one of them felt the same feeling I did, a sense of accomplishment. And they were glad to be here also. Some coming in on emergency fuel. Others with many other buried problems. The ground crew was alert and efficient. All precautions had been taken. Crash and rescue were performing like clockwork. Everybody was eagerly awaiting, awaiting the return of all the aircraft. Crew chiefs standing by to see their airplane come back. Then on the return, stories told immediately on landing, stories that would be retold again and again to other interested parties. How it was up there? Did you feel the hit? Did you see him whiz by you? What sort of tactics did you use? How did the aircraft feel? Then as I look over, I see another aircraft returning to his stall. The pilot's face still covered with his oxygen mask. He comes out of the cockpit. I recognize him. It's old Turk Turley. His face is grave. I know that he is tired also. It was a long day, but he wasn't finished yet. He must give some eagerly awaited information. He must give answers about aircraft performance, weapons performance, fill out the standard forms. In addition to bombing, he was given a task of carrying another piece of equipment, a camera pod mounted on the left wing tip of his aircraft the camera that was to record the outstanding results of this mission. Total destruction of the target by the Air Force through meticulous planning, coordination, and execution. The film would be positive assurance that the Air Force could scratch this target from its files. Another pilot had his own particular problem. He couldn't rejoin with his flight or the tanker had to slip into his alternate base. Another pilot returning. What's all the commotion? What's all the activity? This is Major Fred Tracy, 
He had several holes in his aircraft. His right wing was torn, ripped open by a 37 millimeter shell from a MiG. Another inch and it could have busted a fuel or a hydraulic line, causing many problems. A major problem of control of fuel upon return. The shell entered the cockpit from the side. He grazed Major Tracy's arm and then bashed into the instruments. But Major Fred Tracy was smiling, for he had turned the tables on this big that was shooting at him. He maneuvered his aircraft, causing the MiG to slip in front of him, and then he retaliated. On this day, Major Fred Tracy had the honor to claim the first MiG kill in F-105. Our photo aircraft was back. His tactics had been a little different than ours. Instead of delivering the goods, he was bringing them back. His photos were being eagerly awaited by many people. In fact, he had the photos that the whole world was about to see. The crews quickly removed the packages and brought them back to the lab for immediate processing. The recce pilot had accomplished his mission, and it was the end of another day for him as well. But he still had his forms to fill out also, his questions to answer. As the film was being processed and the pictures started to appear, the results of the raid were obvious. The POL dump had been eradicated. The effects were equally as obvious. The strike would definitely impair the operation of North Vietnam. It would be a major blow to their aggressive southward movement. With less fuel, there would be less travel. While the world was reading about our day's activity on 29 June, we filed a mission in the back of our minds. There was another mission the next day that was planning to do that night, and again we would be ready to deliver whatever the task.